Hi, welcome aboard. About two and a half hours easy drive north of Sydney, there lies one of the world's most beautiful and most secure harbours. Now it nestles behind two rocky headlands, Yakabar to the north and Tomaree to the south, and just to seaward, there are a cluster of small islands. Now that made Port Stephens very difficult to find from seaward in the early days. For many years, those in the know have enjoyed Port Stephens' beautiful blue waters and the attractions of the surrounding countryside. The highway north of Newcastle is forced inland by the Hunter River, so many people bypass the port without suspecting the scenic beauty and pleasures it offers. The first European to bypass Port Stephens was James Cook, who on the 11th of May 1770 wrote that he had sighted from a distance of one mile an inlet, which he named Port Stephens after the Secretary of the Admiralty. The quality of the land around the port was judged poor for agriculture in the early years, so exploration was neglected for a long time, but the deep sheltered waters were often used as a refuge by ships encountering bad weather, and gradually the appeal and attractions came to be appreciated and settlers, among the earliest being Chinese fishermen, gradually moved in. Port Stephens reaches some 15 miles to the west from the heads, which are marked by two tall rocky outcrops, Yakabar on the northern side and Tomaree to the south. On the southern side, Soldiers Point juts north about halfway up, and the waterway is then bifurcated by the peninsula, which forms Lemon Tree Passage, whilst the northern shore is relatively uninterrupted, apart from North Arm Cove. Just to the west of Yakabar, the Mayol River winds its picturesque way northward parallel to the coast and opens delightfully out into the superb Mayol Lake system. The port is a boating man's paradise, offering year-round estuary, reef and game fishing, steady winds for sailing, and almost unlimited scope for the power boat owner. Ramps abound and are well maintained and the combination of easy deep water access and quiet lake cruising and camping along with water skiing, sailboarding and some of the best surfing beaches on the east coast cause holidays to be extended on a regular basis. The annual average temperature is only a couple of degrees cooler than that of South East Queensland and rainfall is seasonal and generally predictable. Port Stephens is a diver's haven and the growing interest in this sport is well catered for by several diving centres offering instruction, equipment and excursions both inside and outside the harbour. The appeal of Port Stephens isn't limited to those who enjoy the water. The surrounding countryside is steeped in history and offers some of the most breathtaking scenery along the New South Wales coast. To the west, the Hunter Valley and its wineries attract visitors from all over the world, whilst the Bulladeela Ranges and Barrington Tops to the north contain a major part of New South Wales's timber industry, with the tallest trees in the state growing nearby. The inhabitants of the Port Stephens Shire are well aware of the importance of their area to New South Wales and are always eager to welcome visitors. Tourist attractions cater for all ages, with Oakvale offering a full range of farmyard and native Australian animals to delight the children.
Even the most casual of gardeners must be fascinated by the superb quality, the quantity and variety of flowers offered by the Rose Farm. And who could resist the most delicious seafood of all, oysters. The Moffat family have been growing oysters in Port Stephens for four generations. They harvest 1,000 dozen per day and their superb oyster barn with its restaurant facilities delight visitors from all over the world. By the turn of the 19th century, it had become obvious that the young settlements at Sydney and Newcastle were sorely in need of space to expand. In 1801, the Brig Lady Nelson, under the command of James Grant, was dispatched north to explore the Hunter River and its tributaries. On the 29th of June in that year, she landed at this point on the Williams River, River at Raymond Terrace, and Lieutenant Colonel William Patterson, along with Ensign Viralia, discovered huge stands of cedar and flooded gum, an excellent shipbuilding timber. The Hunter River was navigable all the way from Newcastle, which had been founded in 1797, and the timber, along with the fertile river flats, made the area attractive as a settlement. Raymond Terrace was established in 1812 and proclaimed a village in 1837. Major industry in the early years was the cutting and the export of cedar, but that has all but disappeared now and the town is supported by a lively hardwood industry along with the Williamtown Rath Base and the huge Tomago aluminium plant. Raymond Terrace still bears all of the character of an early colonial town with many of her original buildings still standing and the surrounding riverbank farms and settlements looking as they must have all those years ago. The Williams and Hunter Rivers have always been the centre of shipbuilding in New South Wales with five of the first 12 steamships built in Australia being launched from the Deptford Yards at Clarence Town further up the river. And now the area is reaching tangibly back into the past with the construction of a faithful replica of the William IV, the first steamship built in this country of indigenous timber. The original William IV was launched in November 1831 and was a fully rigged steam powered paddle wheeler. For over 30 years she traded the New South Wales coastal rivers between the Clarence and Jarvis Bay before being sold to China for the river trade. Her fate's unknown, but there are rumours that she still plies the rivers of the Orient. In June 1985, a momentous event took place on the banks of the Williams River at Raymond Terrace, when the Federal Minister of Transport, Peter Morris, drove the first bolt into the keel scarf of a full-size faithful replica of the William IV. When one considers the size of the ship and the fact that the only side lever double acting beam steam engine in the world is also being designed and built from scratch to power her, one gains some appreciation of the determination and dedication of Ken Whitner, the project director, and his band of followers. The project is a non-profit one supported by the community and government grants and is related to Australia's bicentenary celebrations in 1988. The ship will be based at Raymond Terrace and will ply the coastal and river routes of her predecessor so she will be no dry dock queen. The steam engine is particularly interesting. It's been designed by model steam engineer Ern Winter and retired marine engineer Jeff Lawrence of Swansea is heading up the construction. This is being undertaken by organisations as diverse as Garden Island Dockyard and Rack Williamtown and will match in quality and authenticity the superb job being done on the hull which is being built by a team of shipwrights and indentured apprentices who are reviving traditions and skills almost lost in today's world of high-tech materials and mass production. Ken Strong, one of the world's few voluntary convicts, takes care of details and security and uses his spare time to make beautiful wooden buckets which along with many other souvenirs and artefacts are sold to visitors to help support the project. This is one of the most ambitious and successful replica ship projects in the world. 
It's attracted a tremendous amount of interest. It's a tribute to the people who are doing it. And industries from all over Newcastle and places even further afield have shown their support for it by coming up not only with equipment and materials but also financial support all the way through the project. And it certainly is one of the most worthwhile causes as far as shipbuilding is concerned, is concerned that I've ever seen. If you'd like to help too, a call to Ken Wickner or a visit to the site here which effectively is a little shipbuilding museum will show how you can help too. It's a little difficult to find the entrance to the Moyle River if you don't know exactly where it is, but the patient skipper will be well rewarded for his pains with a trip into enchantment. The river winds its narrow and deep way through a timeless landscape of she oak, paper bark, conifer and Australian bushland past sleepy settlements which haven't changed perceptibly in 200 years. There are fishermen's shacks sitting precariously on the banks, an abundance of wildlife with water birds predominating and the tiny fishing village of Tamboy at the head of the river with its squadron of geese demanding passage by payment of food scraps is a delightful surprise. Just when you think that the river must end, it opens out into the vast expanse of the Broadwater, Boulambate Lake and Myall Lake. Port Stephens has several charter and bear boat companies offering cruises or yachts, giving access to the river and to the Myall Lakes. This is the place to return to nature and teach yourself or the kids to sail in an atmosphere of virgin wilderness. The winds are fair, the scenery is magnificent and there are innumerable inlets and creeks to explore and white sandy beaches to enjoy. Lemon Tree Passage is just about as you would have seen it 50 years ago. There are a few modern boats mixed with the ancient ones that are moored permanently in the passage here and it gives access to the western end of Port Stephens. The passage is fairly narrow, but swing moorings and marinas have enough room to house both ancient and modern boats, and the oyster punts ply the passage and the waters to the west of the port, whilst the slips are always busy with cleaning and maintenance. Port Stephen's oysters are famous throughout the world, and the waters here grow a proliferation of these delicious shellfish. The commercial centre of Port Stephens is Nelson Bay, first settled in the early 1800s by itinerant Chinese shark fishermen, 
The bay has grown slowly over the years, its prime attraction always being tourism and holidays. It has a pleasant seaside village atmosphere which is enhanced by the trawler fleet and the fishing co-op nestled behind the brand new breakwater. The harbour is also home to a fleet of hire and charter boats which serve the needs of the outlying settlements as well as tourists. The magnificent moon shadow tours the port under a cloud of canvas taking charters either by day or by night. Warren R runs fishing charters both inside and outside the port Tamboy Queen does a regular run to the head of the Mile River at the village of Tamboy and the water bus and other boats ply the waters of the port, the Mile River and the lakes. Jamala is regularly chartered for deep sea and game fishing in the offshore waters and here she is taking on a group of divers who have travelled all the way from Wollongong south of Sydney for a diving trip to Broughton Island. Broughton Island is one of those fascinating secrets that you only find out about once you've reached a place like Port Stephens. It lies off the coast to the north of the port and its deep inlet offers shelter from all weathers. First settled late in the 19th century by a group of Greek fishermen, the island is now a national park with these picturesque huts and tents offering shelter for campers, divers and visitors. The waters abound with ocean life and the island is a bird rookery with thousands upon thousands of seabirds nesting on it each year. The main centre of Port Stephens' population ends at Soldiers Point just to the west of Nelson Bay where you will find a brand new boat ramp capable of handling four or five boats at any tide and Soldiers Point Marina. Port Stephens is regularly serviced by air and rail from Sydney and coaches from Newcastle, Williamtown and Raymond Terrace. It has a range of magnificent restaurants, motels, resorts, caravan parks and camping grounds and combines true re relaxation with all of the amenities we've come to expect. It can take you back to an easier and quieter time and weave the magic of beautiful waterways and stunning scenery. It is a blue water wonderland and has something for everyone. The food's great, the weather is kind, and the people are friendly. Port Stephens has been called the fisherman's paradise, the blue water wonderland, the port of romance. I'm sure after what you've seen, you'll agree that it's all of those things and more beautiful Port Stephens.